Hello and welcome. This video is a sequel to a prior video, Anatomy of an Issue, which contained a detailed look at the first issue of the Tom King and Mitch Garrod's miniseries from 2017, Mr. Miracle. I'll link it below for those interested. This video will cover the rest of the series, highlighting all the important developments and character moments. So, spoiler warning. But first, a brief summary of the recurring elements and motifs from the first issue. Each issue opens and closes with the text from the corresponding issue from the original Jack Kirby run. In part, this is a homage to Kirby, while also contrasting Kirby's hyperbolic, dramatic text with the downbeat emotions of the current comic. The phrase, Dark Side Is, and distorted panels occur frequently. Both indicate a heightened and stressed state of mind. Big Bardo's eye color changes from brown to blue, seemingly at random. This suggests that reality is flexible and it shifts between two different versions. This duality is reinforced by the fact that the story takes place on Earth and on New Genesis. Not to mention, Earth is a place of domestic peace, while New Genesis is in a state of war. So again, there's the two contrasting states of reality being represented. To avoid being redundant, these elements and motifs won't be mentioned unless they're important to a specific scene. Overall, the first issue establishes Scott Free's emotional and psychological state. It also establishes that Scott may be in a multi-layered, subtle trap, one that he may have devised himself. As a bit of a side note, when it comes to King's writing, most 12-issue series conform to a certain template. Naturally, issue 1 establishes the premise and the theme, and then it ends on a complication. Issues 2 through 5 elaborate on that complication. The sixth issue is a further complication. The eleventh issue is the resolution, and the final issue is an epilogue. So let's look at the second issue in depth, since it sets up the first complication, and then I'll summarize and highlight the important scenes in the remainder of the series. If you're new and you like what you see, please subscribe and give this video a thumbs up. If you want to go a step further and directly support this channel, there's a link to my Patreon in the description. The issue opens with Mr. Miracle straight up murdering two parademons. These are the cannon fodder in Darkseid's army. What follows are a few more pages of outright violence as Scott is assigned to go from battle to battle by Orion. A few things to note. Despite Orion being Highfather now, Scott calls Orion by his name, not his title. Related to this is Scott's battle cry for New Genesis. Not for Orion, not for Highfather, but for New Genesis. Both of these points suggest Scott doesn't recognize Orion's authority. He'll do what's needed to protect his world, but he refuses to accept that Orion is in charge. The next two pages establish another recurring motif. It balances the high fantasy of a war between New Genesis and Apocalypse with the mundane home life of Scott Free and Big Barda. While this scene takes place on New Genesis, most of these forthcoming scenes will happen on Earth. In this scene, which is primarily humorous, we learn about one of Barda's insecurities. She believes she's too tall, which may imply she thinks she lacks a certain expected level of femininity. It's a humanizing moment. The following scene reinforces Scott's unwillingness to acknowledge Orion's authority. It also establishes that Orion has become a lot like his father, Darkseid. He demands and enforces subservience from his subjects. His enforcer, so to speak, is Light Ray, whose characterization is definitely off-brand. Originally, Light Ray was rather carefree and his own person, but now he's a lackey. This mirrors Darkseid's own lackey, Desaad, who takes care of mundane details. Of course, this is to indicate that Orion is a tyrant like his father. Orion orders Scott and Barda to eliminate Granny Goodness. One very telling, foreshadowing detail is Orion stating, a plan has already been put in motion. As we'll discover later, Orion's plan has two possible outcomes, one favorable and the other less favorable. But regardless of the outcome, Orion's intent is to ensure Scott is trapped. That evening, Metron visits Scott. Presumably, this Metron is the character from the regular DC universe, not the one in this version of reality. We can make that presumption because Metron doesn't arrive in a boom tube. He looks like a faded projection of some type. His warning that Scott is not to know the face of God is very open to interpretation at this point, but it's something to note for the future. The next morning, Scott and Barda have a brief conversation before returning to the battlefield to meet with Granny Goodness. Basically, Scott has some empathy for Granny. He sees that there's some actual goodness in her, 
However, Barta has nothing but negative feelings. We see Granny waiting impatiently, but the moment the boom tube opens, her expression changes dramatically. She is genuinely happy to see her, quote, babies return to her. In fact, she fawns over both Barta and Scott. Her pride in what she helped to create through torture and abuse is very, very clear. They are her greatest achievement, although Scott is clearly the first among equals. To elaborate on her sadistic nature, Granny has Scott and Barta eat in front of Stormforge, who Granny is starving to death. She does this for her own amusement, and quite possibly to see Scott and Barta's reaction. Neither disappoint her. The scene is intended to be a negotiation to end the war, but there were never any terms either side would agree to, so it's an obvious, pointless effort, and a prelude to something more sinister. That evening, Scott and Barta attempt to eliminate Granny, as per Orion's orders. But Granny was warned by Orion that they might try to, quote, break the peace, and he would understand if Granny responded in kind, implying that he sent Scott and Barda on a mission he hoped they wouldn't return from. However, Granny was the person who revealed to the original High Father that Darkseid had acquired the anti life equation. Furthermore, High Father intended Scott to replace him. Not to mention, Granny adores what Scott has become and cannot cause him harm. It also reveals the information that will come into play later. Darkseid can only be eliminated by his son. Everything is prophecy. Everything is controlled by fate. Then to add more weight to Scott's fragile mind, although it's intended to be a loving compliment from Granny, she implies that Scott is Darkseid's son, not Orion. Of course, Scott isn't Darkseid's son, not by blood anyway. However, the implication is that Scott is a spiritual descendant of Darkseid. He's closer to Darkseid in nature than Orion will ever be. At least, that's what Granny sees, and that's what she wants for Scott. This issue ends with Barda beating Granny to death before taking a boom tube back to New Genesis. It's brutal, callous, and a result of everything Granny instilled in Barda. The narration implies that the trap Scott has found himself within is getting more and more complicated. The issue opens with Orion getting confirmation that Granny is dead. The monologue from Scott is a Christmas story Granny told him. It's about a boy living in Nazi-occupied territory who accidentally reveals there are Jewish people hiding in his basement. This is an allusion to Scott himself. An accidental admission will lead to his undoing. Furthermore, the weight, the burden of responsibility Scott feels, will eventually crush him. This leads to a scene where Forager tells Scott that Orion is using his people as cannon fodder. They are dying in the millions, and Orion doesn't care. Future Editor Insert I missed it at first, but the number of dead that Forager quotes is roughly the same as the estimated number of Jewish people who lost their lives in the Holocaust. I doubt that's a coincidence. So, this equates Orion with an infamous 20th century fascist, and it strengthens the illusion between Scott and the boy in the Christmas story. Also, Forager's people are humanoid bugs which gives the extermination of so many lives an abstract final solution vibe. End of future editor insert. Forger pledges allegiance to Scott and refuses to take further orders from Orion. Light Ray appears and executes Forager for treason. The scene ends with Scott saying, Merry Christmas. This solidifies the illusion between Granny's story and Scott's current situation. Scott dismissing the phrase, Darkseid is, is simple denial. Scott asserting that his escape act is not a performance is an interesting character beat. What he does requires skill, not trickery, which Barda acknowledges but also dismisses, because she knows him and he's stating the obvious. So is he arguing with her, or arguing some doubt within his mind? Put another way, does Scott feel like an imposter? Not only is Scott being defensive, but it shows that Barda is, in my opinion, avoiding a discussion about Scott's mental state. Apparently, her tactic is to help Scott through this period by avoiding speaking to it directly, and to distract him long enough until whatever is bothering him goes away. It's a tough, heartbreaking scene, where one realizes that Scott is reaching out, literally and figuratively, and Barda is essentially saying, Look, we have a war to fight. That's more important than whatever is happening to you personally. We'll get to that later. On New Genesis, Scott is introduced to Orion by Funky Flashman. Originally, Funky was Jack Kirby's rather blatant insult to Stan Lee, 
He was a toupee-wearing showman whose only talent was being loud, flashy, and empty of any real talent. Tom King's take on Funky will be to reconcile Kirby and Lee, so to speak, although this is a point for a later issue. The scene between Orion and Scott gets rather brutal. Scott wonders if he and Orion have been infected by the anti-life equation. Orion's reaction is to beat Scott and repeatedly ask him, have you ever seen the face of God? When Scott doesn't have an answer, Orion reveals his face and again repeatedly states, this is the face of God. As Orion repeats this statement, the panels distort and his heroic face, which is a disguise supplied by his mother box, begins to fade to his actual monstrous face. His civilized mask falls away. The implication is obvious, but worth mentioning. Orion believes he is God. He is overwhelmed by his arrogance, and his heritage, being the son of Darkseid, has completely taken over. Or it could imply that Scott was correct, and Orion is infected with the anti-life equation, or both, for that matter. Thematically, it suggests the face of a son is the face of God, and, as Metron warned, Scott should not look at the face of God. So, the vague warning from Metron becomes a bit clearer, and the meaning of it is, Scott should not have a son. Light Ray arrives on Earth to announce Scott has been declared a traitor. Scott's only options are an execution or a trial. Scott opts for a trial. There are a few things to note. Scott is completely unfazed about the accusation. One can infer that he knew this was going to happen, and he thinks this is a stupid, predictable outcome. But it also illustrates Scott is ambivalent about any threats to his own life. Scott wears a Green Lantern t-shirt. He'll wear various t-shirts with recognizable logos in the future. This adds to the sense that this is a different reality. In this reality, heroes are icons, and not necessarily real. They are popular merchandise, much like they are in the reality of the reader. Again, this is a very ambiguous element, but it heightens the sense of a different reality that's separate from the mainstream DC universe. Scott pouring coffee into a mug with the words, I am God, illustrates his defiance of Orion and how he rejects everything Orion stands for. This could also be foreshadowing of Scott becoming Highfather in the sixth issue. The stunt where Scott gets hit by a runaway train is a metaphor for, well, the entire series, really. The trial of Scott is a logical trap, and an example of at least three logical fallacies. Scott accepting Orion's authority to be judge, jury, and executioner at this trial allows for the premise that each response is either true or false. Furthermore, Scott agrees that belief equates to fact, which is untrue by any definition. By not challenging Orion's initial decision, Scott is forced into accepting the terms of the trial, and this is the trap Scott falls into. He has already accepted Orion's predetermined decision before he makes it. Therefore, the entire trial itself is irrelevant. It's an interesting debate of semantics, but it's all predicated on utterly false logic. During the trial, Scott admits that he doesn't actually know who he is. That's the subtext of his speech about his name. This moment of confession is a weakness Orion exploits. He pushes Scott into admitting the dark, hidden thoughts in his mind. Faced with the angry void of his own self, Scott erupts and beats Orion with a fury that stuns everyone. Even Orion doesn't recognize what he's released. The judgment of guilty is, from looking at Orion's expression, an act of mercy. While it was preordained, Orion realizes it might actually be necessary because whatever Scott is living with inside him is unrecognizable, dark, and needs to be destroyed. After that brief moment, Orion quickly assumes his role and departs. The veggie plate is used to break the tension. It doesn't appear to be anything more than a way to offset the intensity of the scene and to highlight an absurd situation with an utterly mundane item. This tray of healthy snacks will appear again later in the series. The opening scene, with Scott placing his hands into the cement cast of Jack Kirby's hands, is a sweet tribute to the creator. The date scene is the year Mr. Miracle was first published. The signature is distinctly Kirby's, and the quote is usually attributed to Kirby, although it's a quote from an anecdote and some suggest Kirby might not have actually said it. Kirby having larger hands than Scott evokes the feeling of a child holding onto a parent's hand, which strengthens the connection that Scott is a child of Kirby.
The subtext of the conversation over this scene is Scott asking for Barda's help, but Barda is not hearing the subtext. Again, she tells him to work it out on his own. She'll support him, but she won't decide anything for him. Otherwise, the issue is Scott's last, mundane day on Earth. Scott and Barda have some adult time, and this becomes relevant the next issue. There's more superhero merchandise. Lots of it. Importantly, Scott gets existential and realizes, at least in part, this is a different reality, where he's the only thing he can definitively say is real. This thoughtful meandering foreshadows his decision in the final issue. If there are two choices, he will take the one with the better qualities, regardless of whether those qualities are real or not. He will accept an illusion over reality, and if he accepts the face of God, then he accepts his own salvation. It's a very circular argument, but it shows he's looking for a solution. He's still looking for a way out of the trap he finds himself within. The issue ends with Barda destroying the escort that has come to take Scott away. Funky Flashman also gets a good beating, directly in front of the cover of Mr. Miracle No. 1. Then, with a single word, Barda declares she will fight for Scott. Notably, her eyes are blue, like the mainstream DC Universe Big Barda. So, the way I interpret this, since it's very intentional, is the blue-eyed Barda is the proactive, ride-or-die superhero. The brown-eyed Barda is the grounded, human version, who is there for emotional support. Although, unlike the superhero version, she's not very good at her role. Admittedly, I'm not married to that interpretation, but I think it's in the area of what was intended. Issue 6 introduces the next complication, and it is, Barda is pregnant. The added complication is Orion is killed by Darkseid and Scott becomes High Father. Yes, Scott becomes a father twice in the same issue. The banal conversation Scott and Barda have while sneaking through New Genesis is just a pretext to Barda revealing she's pregnant. Despite the radical change in status quo, it's a rather straightforward issue. At this point, the premise and all the characters have been established, all the complications have been introduced, and all that's left to do is to give Scott the motivation he needs to survive while resolving the conflict between New Genesis and Apocalypse. This issue foreshadows the Farron Knife, the only weapon that kills gods. While the knife is used to assist Barda during birth, its actual purpose, kill a god, remains unfulfilled. So we know this blade will return at some point to be used as it should be used. Barda gives birth and they name the child Jacob, which is another tribute to Jack Kirby, whose birth name was also Jacob. But it can be interpreted as a little deeper than that. Metaphysically, Kirby is Scott's god and father, since he literally created him. So due to this tribute, Jacob is an avatar of Jack Kirby. Therefore, Jacob is the face of God that Scott should not know. It's a real existential knot. Funky Flashman returns, apparently still alive from the beating Barda gave him. It's a curious choice to have the Stanley mockery be a caregiver to the Jack Kirby tribute. It's one very questionable element of the series, considering Lee and Kirby had a, let's call it, complicated relationship. This issue contrasts the grandeur of the war with the task of raising a newborn child. It also introduces the repeating joke, Batman kills babies. Again, both plot-wise and thematically, not much happens. Everything is already in motion to set up the end of the story. Peace talks begin between New Genesis and Apocalypse. What's worth noting is the story Kanto tells to Scott while they urinate. To summarize the point of that story, there is one reality which is convincing and appears real, but there's another reality that is deceptively real, which leaves behind the unanswered question, which is better, a convincing reality or a deceptive one that appears real. This foreshadows and influences Scott's decision at the end. When Scott and Barda stand before the mirror of goodness, it pulls back the curtain of comic book reality and reveals what they physically look like after years of conflict. The ordinary discussion between Scott and Barda is set up for the resolution in issue 11. It's very ambiguous, but it's how they obtain a Farron knife. Barda has the skills to make one. The peace talks end with Apocalypse making a final offer, 
they will withdraw their troops and give up the anti-life equation if Scott agrees to allow Darkseid to raise his child, Jacob. For the record, this is a repetition of the pact between Highfather and Darkseid from the original New Gods series. Issue 10 is another mundane interlude before the big finale. Overall, Scott and Barda prepare for Jacob's birthday party and they avoid discussing Darkseid's offer. This will sound unintentionally harsh, but the issue emotionally stacks the deck. That is, it shows how much the parents love their child in an effort to make the decision more impactful. This issue also contains the previously mentioned attempted reconciliation of Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Funky Flashman, also known as Stan Lee, tells Scott a story that he and Jacob, also known as Jack Kirby, put together. It's clearly a parallel to the first Galactus and Silver Surfer story from Fantastic Four. First, Funky acknowledges that the story's creativity comes from Jacob. Funky just supplies the words. Next, Funky takes no credit for the story he just told. Historically, that's not exactly how Lee viewed his working relationship with Kirby. Certainly, Lee was always very complimentary of Kirby's talent. But when it came to assigning credit, Lee always assumed his fair share. Some might suggest Lee took more than his fair share. So this scene casually rewrites history. To be fair, its intent is to acknowledge Kirby's creative genius. But to have that genius acknowledged by the person who exploited it the most is a touch misguided. Issue 11 is the resolution. Scott and Barda have agreed to hand over their child to end the war. But secretly, this is an assassination attempt with Jacob as the misdirection. Barda shoots Darkseid with some irresistible miracle energy, but this does not stop him. Darkseid beats both Barda and Scott down. In one final heroic effort, Scott reaches for the veggie tray and removes the hidden ferret knife. It's a knife made from the bones of Orion. In effect, both the people Darkseid considered his son strike him down, which fulfills the prophecy in a rather unique manner. Darkseid's lackey, Desaad, reveals that he's actually Metron and informs Scott he has defeated and escaped death. He further reveals Scott is not where he should be. There is another universe, the mainstream DC universe, and this is where he should be. Metron has an interesting role. Jack Kirby obviously based him on the angel Metatron, who is, in very rough terms, the voice of God, which is how he's portrayed this issue. At first, he's the voice of the god, Darkseid, but that's a disguise. Metron accurately knows Scott's deception, as if he knows how this story plays out. He seems to know too much. Which is not out of character for Metron, who spends his life trying to understand the secrets of the universe. So it's not a stretch to suggest he knows the secrets of the story. In the end, he calls Scott, my son, and says it's time to look into the face of God, implying that he is God, or at least, an emissary of God. Again, by implication, that would actually make Metron the voice of the writer, Tom King. Which makes sense. A soft self-insert is somewhat necessary. Because it would be difficult, with only one issue to go, to organically go from the death of Darkseid to the revelation that Scott is not where he should be. Again, this is an element, like most elements, that's open to interpretation. The issue opens, with Mr. Miracle being watched by celebrities and comic professionals as he fails to escape a trap. It hard cuts to Bardo waking up and discovering a happy Scott in the shower. What follows is Scott having a series of conversations with all the people who died. He gains their perspective on his situation. To a person, they all state he chooses an escape from reality in favor of this illusion he has accepted. The only exception is Darkseid, who, true to form, remains silent. We discover that Barda is pregnant again, this time with a daughter they intend to name Rosalind, which is the actual name of Jack Kirby's wife. Again, a nice tribute, if one doesn't dig into the idea that the husband and wife are now siblings. I don't know the significance of Jacob playing with the toys of the dead, but it has to be noted. There's a full page of a young Scott informing us that the fourth world is what one imagines when their eyes are closed, which one can interpret as what's seen when imagining or dreaming, or, in a more sinister manner, what one sees when they're dead. Scott rejects his father's evaluation with violence, and then receives comfort and forgiveness from Oberon, his spiritual father. 
Oberon also gives Scott permission to live in the illusion he's created. Scott's monologue to Barda is him deciding to live in the present, and the issue ends with Barda playfully challenging Scott's declaration that he can always escape. It's a question for the reader. Does Scott accept this illusion and live a peaceful life, or does he escape? The final panel distorting as Scott and Barda kiss is difficult to interpret. Due to the hopeful atmosphere of the issue, it's unlikely that Scott closing his eyes indicates that he dies, or, for that matter, returns to reality. The strongest possibility is that Scott, with his eyes closed, is imagining his new life. Overall, the series is rather good. It's loaded with a variety of elements, such as foreshadowing, metaphor, and illusion told in a very coherent, not overly pretentious way. It has a few flaws, but nothing that's distracting. It's a solid story, and a great example of mature storytelling using a superhero protagonist. It allows for a variety of interpretations, some more oblique than others. In essence, both Tom King and Mitch Garretts put everything they have into every single page. And it shows. In fact, I'm willing to admit there are easter eggs and details that were missed, despite my best efforts. There's one detail that needs to be discussed, and it's a pretty big one. The ending is possibly irresponsible. Which is a rather heavy statement, and it's an evaluation many will disagree with. However, I hope the various explanations are given some consideration before the comments explode. First of all, it has to be acknowledged the intent of the ending was to be hopeful and uplifting which it is, on the surface. But there are subtextual implications that are difficult to overlook, and these present a different conclusion. Let's get into it now. In the end, Scott uses the illusion over reality, which is an understandable, logical choice, given the options. In the illusion, he's the ruler of paradise. He's a hero married to a loving, supportive partner. He has a son and a daughter on the way. Life is pretty damn good. It's a happy ending. How is that irresponsible? What makes this irresponsible is Scott's choice to avoid addressing the issues that led to the creation of this illusion. Those problems still exist. They've just been suppressed or deferred, not resolved. Which is not the way one deals with matters of trauma, depression, or acts of self-harm. However, the comic suggests that as long as you build something that feels real, it will become real. Adopt a fantasy to avoid reality. Avoidance becomes a solution to deep, fundamental problems. Let's come at this another way. Scott decides not to make the mistake his father made when he was traded to Apocalypse. He doesn't want to give his child to a malicious tyrant and then have that child endure the torture he did as a young man. This is a very understandable motivation. It's very identifiable and a choice practically everyone with a shred of humanity would make in that situation. It's also implied that by making this choice, by defeating Darkseid, Scott has overcome the anti-life equation. Instead of being overwhelmed by the stakes, like his father before him, Scott decides to reject the options given to him. He finds hope in a hopeless situation. The anti-life equation, as established in the series, is a metaphor concerning mental illness. By extension, killing Darkseid, the living embodiment of that equation, is the cure to his mental struggles. He ends his mental distress, quite literally, by lashing out with violence and murder. Metaphorically, defeating the anti-life equation makes sense. Unfortunately, it implies violence is the cure for Scott's condition. So it's not exactly a positive message. Certainly, superheroes tend to think with their fists, but that doesn't make it a good response or a helpful one. Nor does it address the underlying cause that prompted that response, which is the important point. Putting aside the different realities and metaphors, there's also what's explicitly supplied by the text. Scott died, went to heaven, and decided to stay. Or Scott died, went to hell, and decided to stay. I suppose there's a third, spiritual option too. Scott died, went to purgatory, and decided to stay. In these scenarios, Scott prefers death over life. Again, the message it sends is not a good one. Now, one can accept the intended happy ending. I'm not trying to ruin that for you. But due to the subtext and areas of interpretation, it's hard to overlook some relevant points. The primary being, Scott avoids addressing his issues. At a few points, he does acknowledge them, but he doesn't resolve them. 
And ultimately, there's the heavy implication that an illusion is preferable to reality, which is an irresponsible suggestion to anyone who suffers mental distress. Or worse, someone who's considering an alternative to life, if you catch my meaning. Even though one can easily see the positive message being projected, the elements baked in make suggestions that allow for a radically different conclusion. I suppose, like Scott himself, the reader is faced with a choice. Close your eyes and accept the happy ending. Or face the reality of the subtext and arrive at a different conclusion. I leave it entirely in your hands. There are a few bits of discussion that I couldn't fit anywhere organically, so I thought I'd take a moment and include them at the very end. The artwork by Mitch Garretts is just excellent. The color choices are appropriate for every scene, and they elicit the proper response. Honestly, a lot of heavy lifting is done by the artwork. Garrett's capability, through color and facial expression, projects the intent of every scene. For someone reasonably new to comics, it's perfection. Just evaluating the artwork itself and the artistic choices within could be an entirely separate video. Since this video is already a lot longer than I expected, I will just add that Garrett's work is practically flawless. It adds so much to the series itself. It's difficult to imagine it being illustrated by anyone else. What he brought is a singular, subtle voice that speaks without saying a word. It's worthy of the highest praise. Every issue had two covers. On the surface, that looks like a marketing tactic to boost sales. However, it has a practical, thematic function. It represents the two realities being explored. The covers by Nick Darrington are very classic and heroic. They are very superhero focused, like a typical mainstream DC comic. They highlight the action, conflict, or danger. Mitch Garrett's covers are more emotionally relevant. That is, they are quieter and more subdued, with a focus on the emotional quality of the issue. This may not be a perfect comparison, but the point remains. The series has two covers for every issue to illustrate it takes place in two separate realities. And for the most part, those covers represent the separate heroic and emotional aspects of the story. Admittedly, there were other points of discussion that just never made it past the notes stage. There's the concept of a parent, or a father specifically, being a god to a child. There's the lack of black borders on the panels, which required a deeper formalism discussion. I even had a half-formed argument about determining what is, air quotes, real, and other related existential nonsense. All of these seemed like deviations into much longer arguments. They became my own anti-life equation. So I removed them. But I'm mentioning them now for others to pick apart and discuss if they so desire. Finally, if you made it this far, wow, thank you for watching or listening, whatever the case may be. I really appreciate your attention because this was a lot of work. And I hope the comments don't go too crazy about the critical analysis of the ending, or anything else for that matter. Please leave a like, comment, and subscribe if you're new. If you'd like to go a step further, check out my Patreon and show your support. The more support I get, the more freedom I have to produce longer, in-depth videos like this on a regular basis. Thanks to all my current supporters on Patreon and on YouTube. You're the greatest, and you make a project like this possible. Extra special thanks to Phil Sagan, Edward Clayton Andrews, Corey Drew, Alexa Zernish, Brian Deaton, Johnny Lim, Steve White, Taylor Dull, and Matt Marino. You are all justified and ancient. Hey look, a playlist. Check it out for a variety of fine video products. Until next time.